creating an optimal workspace that boosts productivity, concentration, and creativity is important. So start by organizing your area, keeping it tidy and clutter-free. Natural light is super beneficial, so open curtains or use well-placed lamps. Avoid distractions by turning off notifications and finding a quiet environment. Foundational things. Get more, get sunlight in your eyes in the morning, especially on cloudy days, as many days of your life as you can. Yep. And make it a pleasurable thing. Yeah. Right? Just get up and get outside. Get out on a porch. Get outside. You know, take sunglasses. Just do it, right? Um, uh, most days, if not every day. Try and get your sleep right. Now, younger people with different schedules, like, don't give up a social life. But, you know, try and get a good amount of sleep. Personalize your space with inspiring elements like plants or artwork or whatever is specific to you. Use ergonomic furniture to support and comfort and prevent discomfort. <laughs> Keep essential tools within reach to avoid interruptions. Take regular breaks to recharge your energy and experiment with different techniques that find what best works for you. Start with what I've doubled down on. I've doubled down on the idea, which perhaps I stated last time we spoke and perhaps not, but I certainly believe that our state of mind and body at any point in time is strongly dictated by our state of mind and body in the hours and days prior to that. And on the one hand, people are going to hear that and say, well, duh, you know, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to feel like garbage. And if you're well rested, you'll feel great. That's kind of the top contour of it. Mm -hmm. But when one looks at the neuroscience, for instance, of sleep, you start to realize that, you know, the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that you're going to get in any 90 minute bout of sleep, as your sleep is broken up into these 90 minute segments, more or less, is strongly dictated by the ratio of slow wave sleep, aka deep sleep and rapid eye movement sleep that you had in the previous 90 minute bout. And then when you start to look at the research in terms of waking states, you start to find that your ability to be focused, say for a bout of work in the morning or the afternoon, or a creative brainstorm session, or I don't know, to maybe drill into some personal issue that you're dealing with during therapy or just on a walk or while journaling is not a square wave function. You know, none of us should sit down and expect ourselves to just drop into that state. Mm -hmm. Much of our ability to move into that state effectively, whatever effective means, right? Whatever the target or goal of that bout, as I'm calling it, is, is going to be dictated by what happened in the previous moments and hours. Acetylcholine is the neurochemical that we want to think about anytime we're talking about neural plasticity and in particular attention, high attentional states. So everyone knows that the brain is very plastic early in life. So from birth until about age 25, you can learn so much for better or for worse. I always say the downside is that early in life, you're, you have less control over your life circumstances, but your brain is very plastic. So there's a, you know, dark and light to that. Later in life, you have a lot more control generally over your life circumstances, but the brain becomes less plastic. However, we know based on Nobel Prize winning work and recent work in addition to that, that the neuromodulator acetylcholine is secreted when we pay attention to something very specific. It acts as sort of a spotlight in the brain, making certain synapses, the connections between neurons more active and more likely to be active again than others to our movement really changed the way that I train and exercise to some extent. And, and, and actually my whole philosophy on what's possible in terms of training and how to incorporate it into a week in a way that really works to build strength and endurance and feel really good in one's body all the time. And then the other one is relationships, which probably reflects my place in life you know, where I'm 47 now, I've chosen to delay having a family, but that's a primary focus. But also having done a lot of personal work, you know, in, toward my mid forties, you know, I thought I, I was quote unquote there. And then realizing that- It's a trap door. It's a trap door. <laughs> and then realizing that there, I guess here again, I'll, I'll use language that Paul uses, which is that there were some unresolved core conflicts. And this, this idea of core conflicts is, is really, I think, the most appropriate way to, to put the important psychological stuff that people need to work through. Everyone has them. Many people have trauma. Not everyone has trauma. But as defined as an event that 
fundamentally changes the way that your nervous system works such that you function less well mm -hmm. in some or many domains of life. Again, I robbed that definition from Paul Conti and I'm far less eloquent than he is in delivering it. But realizing that there's still some core conflicts that I needed to resolve and I've been I've been going whole hog on that and it's uh, it's been interesting to say the least. Very good idea if you want to be healthy to do 3 days a week of weight training. We're talking about 10 minutes of warm up and 50 to 60 minutes of working out. If you want, we have a, a schedule like of a, that encompasses all this. That's on hubermanlab.com. You get it free. There's nothing to sell here. It's just like a fitness toolkit. That we have a sleep toolkit. All that zero cost. Oh, wow. You just download it as a PDF, three pages. So you Amazing. don't have to listen to me talk. Yeah. Then I would say three days a week of resistance training and train your legs, guys. Come on. Hmm. You know, like have, like come on. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and uh, <laughs> and. Three days a week of some cardiovascular work. People might say, well, listen, I'm in my 20s or 30s. Like, I'm not worried about it. It's not about being worried about a heart attack. It's about maintaining blood flow to everything. What is some cardiovascular work? Okay, so I think one day a week, you take a long, slow jog or pedal on the bike or treadmill or swim, whatever your favorite thing is. If you want to make it social and you're out with somebody, you could literally get one, like wear a weight vest for a hike if you want to make it harder. But um, you could skip rope, whatever. The other cardio day, sprint. It's real easy, find a patch of land, sprint for 30 seconds to 45 seconds, then walk back for a minute to 90 seconds, sprint again, do that five to 10 times. Till, by, by the end, you will have increased your speed, your VO2 max, your output. And then another day, make, do something fun, like take, I got a friend, he's a musician, I won't name his name, he's a well-known musician, he's, he's like really into Pilates right now, probably for a bunch of reasons. <laughs> um, loves Pilates, he's like, yo, I'm loving Pilates, and then he's Pilates. <laughs> Some other cardiovascular thing that's kind of fun. Could be basketball, yeah. could be skateboarding, like something that you enjoy at least three days a week. And the other day is weight training. It's not complicated. And then one day a week, just take off as a recovery day. I just want to backtrack one step because I failed to say that Friday, the idea is to get that VO2 max up. But guess what? It's also designed to indirectly hit the legs. We hit legs on Monday. Oh, yeah. And they've recovered. We now know that protein synthesis maximizes after these training workouts at about 48 hours and then starts to taper off. Now you read that, you hear that a lot, especially on social media and people think you have to hit a muscle group every 48 hours, but no, you hold on to the protein synthesis you generated for another couple of days. So that Friday sprint on the bike workout or sprint on a field workout and jumping is indirectly targeting the quads and calves and hamstrings. And so you're keeping them online for hypertrophy. So when you hear all this, you might think, gosh, that's a lot of working out, but what we're really talking about is a long hike with friends or family on Sunday or by oneself, 90 minutes to three hours. You're talking about an hour workout on Monday morning, You're talking about sitting in the sauna and cold on Tuesday. You're talking about running for 20 or 30 minutes on Wednesday, You're talking about doing some dips and overhead presses, maybe some chins and a little bit of neck work on Thursday. You're talking about doing a 12 minute workout on Friday. And you're talking about going to the gym for an hour, hour and 15 minutes more casual kind of, I don't want to call it what it is, but you could call it a vanity workout. I, I called it that to Joe Rogan. And he was like, that's ridiculous. Bicep is key muscle group. And I was like, give me an example. And he's like, well, you know, when you're grappling and you're about to choke somebody out, and I was like, okay, well, that's you. But he's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, if you ever fixed up, yeah, actually I chipped my tooth really hard once by, I was trying to fix something with a wrench and you're, you're pulling with your bicep and your arm yeah. toward you and you broke loose and, you know, chipped my tooth. But Keep your head out of the way. Good thing you train your neck. Yeah, this is mostly a falsey, the, this one front tooth. Exactly. Good thing I could have knocked myself out. But, the, but, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, bicep is good for, forearm strength is good for. So Joe is absolutely right. But I think that when you look at all of that, it's not that much time in the gym. You can mm -hmm. do all, all of that at home. There are ways to do the leg workout even at home or in natural terrain for the hikes and things. And so it's that's the, the schedule. And again, if you think about that schedule, each day you're accomplishing that endurance leg strength, cold and heat adaptation, and all the neural stuff that goes with that. Torso, keep the torso strong. But here again, and we can say the torso work is indirectly hitting biceps and triceps. Then running for 20 years, being able to run a couple miles is a good skill. And what you find is that if you trained your legs properly and you give them enough rest and the cold and heat really help too, you are so strong on that 20 or 30 minute run. Your tibs are strong, you know, you no floppy feet, no back pain. You're running with, with vigor and you go, wow, like this is great. And so what I've noticed in the last 
24 months or so is that I continued to get stronger and better in each of these areas. And supposedly that's not supposed to happen. I'm 47. You know, Atia the other day said, you know, you and I were both far more physically robust when we were in our teens. I was like, speak for yourself. I was getting injured all the time. My yeah. body hurt. I was unhappy. I was skateboarding then, so I was slamming a lot. But mm -hmm. I find that this routine has really helped me. Okay, so sunlight, that. I think have some tool to be able to control your stress. Some people are super mellow, but some non pharmaceutical tool, the double inhale through the nose, the physiological size. So big, deep inhale through the nose, then sneak in a little bit more air, then dump all your air with your mouth. That's the fastest way to calm down. If you're scared of public speaking, if you, um, you know, you're tense about some interaction and listen, if I can't bring you on board with that way, um, let's, I'll just be very direct. You want to delay orgasm. It works for that too. Because remember, orgasm is a increase in the what we call the sympathetic tone of the nervous system. It's actually kind of like the stress response. And then comes the relaxation afterwards. So, you know, it's sort of like, if you need like a, a re an incentive. For, for real. Well, and in the tantric community, they talk about using this type of breathing to, to for couples to be able to have sex for long periods of time to be able to explore the different forms of, of sensual connection. So this is really where it gets cool. Turns out, because of when the way that we view the visual world when we move through space, when our head moves or when we walk and things flow past us, that these lateralized eye movements are what happens when you move forward in space, when you're walking, when you're moving forward towards something. And that suppresses activation of the amygdala. Now you say, why? Well, okay, so then 2018, my laboratory did an experiment. There was actually a graduate student in my laboratory where we're looking at fear. In this case, we were looking at fear to big looming objects that either trigger freezing or running and hiding. There's a brain area that's in your brain and my brain that mice also have that triggers a third option, not run and hide, not freeze, but forward confrontation. This is the, no, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna move forward in the face of adversity. This is the growth mindset. I'm gonna lean into friction. And it turns out that this circuit is linked to the dopamine reward pathway. When we move forward, in the face of a threat, and obviously we want to do this in healthy, adaptive ways, we suppress activity of the amygdala through physical action of moving forward, and there's a signal sent to the areas of the brain that control dopamine reward. Those reward centers then trigger the release of dopamine to reward forward effort in the face of stress or threat. So when you hear about people saying, look, take some physical action when you're feeling exhausted, Take some forward physical action when you're feeling overwhelmed by this traumatic experience. Now that could be in the form of a walk. In the Now this therapist, she figured out with EMDR, because you can't take people walking around for therapy sessions, she figured out that these lateralized eye movements are what triggers suppression of the amygdala. And it makes perfect sense because the amygdala, this threat detection center in our brain, it doesn't connect to the limbs. So how does it know if you're moving forward? Well because the eyes are moving. You have these reflexive eye movements that move anytime you're moving through space. So th to make Dude. this a little more succinct, it's really forward movement, action, pushing yourself across that threshold, not only rewards you, but it suppresses activity of the fear centers in the brain. And these are ancient hardwired mechanisms. These aren't hacks. These are things that mother nature right. installed in us. I think so. It's, a, it's probably two pronged. One, the EPA is a fundamental structural lipid for neuronal membranes and for the neurons in particular that release neuromodulators such mm -hmm. as serotonin and dopamine. Mm -hmm. That's one. The other is that these neuropod cells in the gut, as they're called, sense, as you point out, sugar, essential fatty acids, mm -hmm. and essential amino acids, and signal via the vagus to the dopamine centers of the brain. So your gut is subconsciously signaling to your brain what kinds of nutrients are coming into your system. Yep. And when you have a lot of flavorful food or and or high caloric food, but it's not high in nutrients, it sets that system totally out of whack because there's an increase in dopamine for sure from the taste of the food that's not matched by that subconscious parallel signal. Mm -hmm. By the way, this, this is not woo biology. This is coming from the laboratories of Diego Borges at Duke University School of Medicine. Charles Zucker, who's a Howard Hughes medical investigator at Columbia University, has done this for sugar sensing and a number of other laboratories. 
It's shown that this pathway from the subconscious signaling from the vagus to the dopamine centers of the brain are driving an, an appetite for certain kinds of foods. However, when these neurons, these neuropod cells in the gut are quote unquote satisfied, they're seeing the, the nutrients they want to see. They signal to the brain dopamine release within the brain, but they also are signaling satiety. Mm. And that's really what you want.